All right, is this live? Sounds like it's working. Hi, uh, welcome to Valley Ortho University. I'm Noel Armstrong. Just a little bit of shopkeeping before I get started. The first thing to understand is that I can't see you. I'm looking at a screen and a blank wall. So there's an element of strangeness to this, so I apologize uh, for that. But if you have questions, the important take home on that is, if you do have questions, use the Q&A for those questions. There's no other way really to get through to us. We can't see you, but if you use the Q&A, there is a PA and an MA here answering questions for people who have them. So please feel free to use that. Um, at the end of the lecture, there is a survey. So please fill out the survey, make some recommendations and suggestions for improvements. Um, if you do have questions that we don't have time to answer during the presentation, um, you can uh, send them in to us anyway, and we can email those responses. Some of the questions, if they're judged to apply to a large group of people, if they're particularly interesting, they might be shared um, and we may answer those um, in the lecture format. But most of the answers are just going to come to you privately through the MA and PA who are here helping us. So um, the next event also, just a reminder, I think this will come up at the end, but Dr. Pevney, uh, one of the sports orthopedists, is going to be talking about common ligament injuries of the knee in February and you'll get a little more information about that. So without further ado, um, let's move into today's topic. It's going to be foot pain 101. Um, little caveat, uh, little warnings. I've tried and I think I've been incredibly kind to you in some of the pictures that I'm going to show you. Um, dealing with feet, some of the images can be striking, let's just put it that way. Um, I've tried to use images that are uh, tolerable for the vast majority of the population. Um, but if you have a weak stomach, if you're eating, if there's things that you're not comfortable looking at, I just want to give you a little warning up front. Be ready for that. Um, first thing I wanted to start with was um, podiatry. I am a podiatrist. Um, a podiatrist is just a physician who treats, diagnoses problems with the foot and ankle. Um, when I was training, there were really only two criteria for being a foot doctor. <laughs> One of them was that you couldn't hate feet. You couldn't be too grossed out by feet. The other is you couldn't like feet too much. You have to have a pretty neutral position when it comes to feet. Not a lot of strong emotion one way or the other. Um, we diagnose and treat conditions of the foot and ankle. We don't amputate the entire foot, um, but pretty much everything else is within the scope of practices that relates to that part of the body. It's a four-year undergrad, four-year postgrad, and then residency on top of that. Um, our practice differs a little bit from a foot and ankle orthopedist um, in the breadth of what we treat. Um, we treat a lot more skin conditions, nerve conditions, diabetic conditions. Sometimes um, foot and ankle orthopedists certainly treat that as well. Um, we also have a surgical emphasis, um, and it just depends on the training and the field that you want to go into within podiatry. My training was primarily surgical, but of course, we do all of those things. We treat skin conditions, we treat nerve conditions, tendon, ligament, joint, sports injuries, orthotics, uh, fractures, things like that. So just a few quick facts about the human foot. You may know all of this already. Um, the human foot is actually a very complicated, complex structure. 24, uh, 26 bones in the foot. We say that that's a fourth of all the bones in the body. Now, if you've had anatomy, you know that most of the time they'll tell you there's only 206 bones in the human body. But if you count the fabella, a little bone in the lateral head of your gastrocnemius, we get up to 208. And we can say there's exactly one fourth of all the bones in the human body are in your two feet. Within those uh, feet also, there's 33 joints, over 100 ligaments, tendons, and muscles, um, tons of sweat glands, a lot of nerve endings. You walk an average, the average person walks about uh, four times around the earth in their lifetime. So feet get a tremendous amount of use. Because of that, 75% of the people um, in the United States will have a diagnosable foot condition. Doesn't mean they'll always see a doctor for it, but it means they have a problem severe enough that there is a diagnosis that they could be given for that problem. And many of them will seek treatment. So. Actually, quite a few problems with the feet come up. Um, this is Foot Pain 101, that's the lecture. So um, I wanted to kind of hit some of the things that I do just on a daily basis. Um, it'd be cool to talk about some of the cutting edge techniques or things that are out there. 
um, experimental techniques or diagnostic techniques that we could use. But really, um, I think it's more useful to the general public just to talk about some of the things that are most likely for you to encounter in your own lives or those of your family or friends. So one of the things that we treat most often are nails. And here again, there's that caveat I was telling you about. Some people don't feel comfortable looking at this picture. Uh, many people, frankly, don't feel comfortable watching toenail surgery. Even people who are battle-hardened OR nurses sometimes shy away from it. But this is an example of an ingrown toenail. Now, the toenails and fingernails, they're both unguum, so hard keratin deposits at the end of a joint. You know, if you know mammals are sometimes called ungulates if they have hoofs. Claws are also unguum, so these are just our version of claws. A toenail takes about seven months, six months is pretty quick, seven months to grow from root to tip. There is a function to the toenail despite the fact that it seems like kind of a used to, useless vestigial organ, it does have a function, it has several functions. One is protective. Um, obviously, if you drop certain sharp objects on your foot, they're less likely to puncture a toenail than they are to puncture the skin. The other is, and this one is, is what I think is a little less known and kind of interesting, the toenail provides a firm backing so that when you're using the tactile sense of your foot, if this were completely spongy and rubbery, you wouldn't get a lot of tactile feedback for your ground position and your balance. So there is some, it's not a lot, I mean, you can function very well without toenails, but there is some tactile response that is enhanced by toenails. Um, so toenails do have a function. Ingrown toenails are very, very common. Um, they, about 20% of the office visits for foot-related complaints in family practice, primary care offices, are just ingrown toenails. Ingrown toenails, if you've ever had them, uh, it could be that you had them when you're a teenager, when you're pregnant. There's a reason why they're very, very common in young people. I myself had one when I was in my uh, high school years. There seems to be a connection between how quickly your nail grows and how often you get ingrown toenails. If the nail grows too quickly, it tends to get bound down a little bit more in the center, tethered down, it tends to curve in more at the side. So quicker growth phases correlate to higher incidence of ingrown toenails. So that would include, again, teenagers, high incidence of ingrown toenails. Pregnant women have a higher incidence of ingrown toenails. That being said, the most common reason to get an ingrown toenail is to cut the nail inappropriately. I don't know if you can see that um, cursor on the screen, but I hope you can. If you cut into the corners of your toenails, either for cosmetic reasons or for comfort reasons, then you have a much higher risk of getting an ingrown toenail where you have cut into the corner. So when we tell people to cut their toenails, we tell them to keep them short, but don't cut into the corners. Don't dig into the corners. And obviously, peeling and picking the toenails is a good way to get them to rip down into the corners and get an ingrown toenail. Um, obviously, shoe pressure can contribute to that also. If you have shoes that are very tight, pointy, that come to a tip that pressurize the corner of your toenail skin, then that will grow in a little bit more also. Let me go back here a little bit. So when you see a toenail like this, you can soak it. But usually, once the skin has been punctured by the toenail, you have to see a physician who numbs the toe and removes the affected corner of the toenail. And probably many of you in the sound of my voice have had that happen. Um, toenails have other problems. Sometimes people come in and just say, they may be coming in for something else and they'll ask, why is my nail so brittle? Why are my nails in such poor health? Um, why do they curve like this? There is a connection between poor nutrition and dry, brittle nails. There's also a hereditary factor, some factors that you can't really control. Um, sometimes people have to use uh, moisturizing agents for their toenails to make them grow out a little bit better. So urea, 40% nail lacquer is a very common one that we recommend if you do tend to have dry, brittle nails. Um, this curvature of the toenail that you see, I get a lot of questions about that certainly correlated with age. So as people age, their once flat, perfectly smooth toenails will start to curve in at the corners. And I'll often get questions of why that's happening.
people will think maybe it's nutrition, maybe something else, but really the, the shape of your toenail is determined by the shape of the bone under the toenail. As we age, knuckles tend to get a little bit more bossed out, they get a little bit more bone prominence around them. Sometimes you see a growth of a spur under the toenail, such as this image that you see in the bottom left. That's a spur growing up under the toenail. So a ridge forming around the joint where the toenail matrix is will cause the nail to have just a very slight curvature at its base. And as it grows out, that curvature will increase and the nail will become much more ingrown toward the tip. So this change in toenails over time is very, very common. Curvature of the toenails over time is, is almost to be expected. Um, more information about toenails. One of the things that's very common for people to ask questions about is this. The nail becomes brittle, chalky, powdery, ridged, elevated, sometimes quite uncomfortable. Toenail fungus is a very, very common condition. You see there in the third bullet point down that it's 3 to 12 percent of the population. That's the overall population. I know that's a wide range of statistics, but that's what the studies that I reviewed came up with. Uh, that is much, much higher as the population ages. Toenail fungus becomes much, much more common. Um, the reasons for toenail fungus, um, usually you have to have exposure, so you have to be exposed to a fungus. Um, that's not a problem. We're all exposed to fungus all the time. The common dermatophytes, they're called the, the fungi that cause toenail fungus, are also the same ones that cause athlete's foot. Very, very common at swimming pool, locker rooms, hotel rooms, um, any damp surface um, where other people are who have it can certainly spread it to someone else. So you get exposed to the fungus, it can live in the skin, it can work its way under your toenail very gradually over time just by having athlete's foot or if you have an injury to your toenail. So a lot of time people who hike a lot get some boot bang, bang the nail up, lose the nail several times. Notice that as it comes back in, it comes back in more thick, discolored, and they start to worry that maybe it's fungus. Then what happens is you take your nail clipper and you clip the nail that's thick and ridged and looks a little abnormal. Then you clip the healthy nails. It's a really good way to implant that fungus into your other toenails. So the recommendation generally is don't clip the fungal toenail and then clip the healthy nails with that same clipper right after that. You may be implanting that material. Uh, if you do have athlete's foot on the skin, you wanna treat that so that it doesn't spread to the toenails. Once you have toenail fungus though, it's not easy to eradicate. It can be treated. But if you look at those statistics, those are not impressive statistics. <laughs> One of the studies I just reviewed, uh, Lamisil, which is what we would consider the best, the gold standard medication orally for treating toenail fungus. Once a day, 90 days, have to have a liver test before you take it. It has about a 46% cure rate for toenail fungus. Now I've seen other studies where that's a little higher, up to 60%, but 46%, one in two people who take Lamisil, I'm going to revise my estimates when I talk to people about this. One in two people who take it are going to have a good result. There's another older dose there, which we don't use, Spornot's pulse dosing, terrible efficacy. A lot of people ask me about the new topicals, Jublia, Keratin. Um, very, very expensive, often not covered by insurance. And the success rate for those, as you see below, is about 17% cure of toenail fungus. If you use them for an entire year, labor intensive, and the results are not that impressive. 47% of people will say it did provide them with a benefit. So if your goal is to just make your nails look a little better, be a little bit more manageable, those can certainly be effective for you. Uh, laser, I get a lot of questions about laser treatment. Um, the studies are all over the map. Uh, probably the best study um, that reviewed several other studies that have been done about laser came up with about a 30% cure rate with laser. The downside to laser is it's not covered by insurance, uh, cash out of pocket. It's usually around $1,200. If you go to Grand Junction in Denver, you can find it for a little bit less. So that's toenail fungus. Any questions about that, feel free to submit. If we get to them later, then uh, that'll be great. Let's move on uh, to the most common thing that you'll see in any foot and ankle clinic. Um, every family practitioner Every internal medicine doctor, every orthopedist, uh, every chiropractor, 
we'll see a fair share of this because the problem is just so common. And that is the patient comes in saying, it's killing me under my heel. I get out of bed in the morning and I feel like I can barely walk. Feels like I'm stepping on a, an ice pick or something really sharp. The pain then lets up as I get warmed up and then the pain returns after I've been walking on my foot for a while. If I get on my foot for too long during the day, it becomes just unmanageable. Um, this, is, um, this is a very, very common problem as you see here. It is more common in women than in men, but 1% of US adults every single year will suffer some form of heel pain. Out of those people who suffer heel pain, 54%, over half of them won't just have a little niggling, nagging pain in their heel. It will be severe enough that it interferes with their everyday activities, and 25% of it would be classified as severe. Now, severe is a criteria where we say, well, you may need a immobilization, crutches, pain medication. Two million treatments a year for heel pain. Very, very common problem. Um, what is heel pain? Typically, more often than not, it's what we call plantar fasciitis. If you look at the structure of the foot, there is a belt that goes from the heel to the ball of the foot, holds up your arch. That belt is a very tough, strong material, but it's under a tremendous amount of stress. And so micro tears, micro trauma, is very common in that structure. That structure is the plantar fascia. And so the strain, the most, the most strained part, the area that's under the most tension, that is the most prone to injury, is right here on the inside of the heel. The inside of the heel, right where it takes origin. So that is the most common area, but it could strike anywhere. That's just the most common area. Um, plantar fasciitis is a name that we think is obsolete. We still use it all the time, but there's really no itis involved. The reason we say that, I don't want to get too technical on this, but itis implies inflammation. So that implies uh, swelling and redness and warmth and some inflammatory markers that can respond to anti-inflammatory medication. Plantar fasciitis is not like that. Plantar fasciitis is more like a degenerative condition of your heel. The collagen fibers that make up that belt become disrupted. As they become disrupted, there is a laying down of more collagen that's poorly organized collagen, so the tissue thickens but even though it's thickening, it's still weak and it's still injured, and so it's not a very effective healing response. So fasciosis um, is probably going to become the term for this uh, once enough people catch on to the idea that it's not an inflammation. That does have something to do with the treatment options available, available to it also. Our treatment goals used to be reducing quote-unquote inflammation. Now the goal is to restore circulation. It seems to be a very poorly circulated area. And through stretching and, and other techniques, we try to restore the circulation of the plantar fascia, try to allow it to heal, while also giving it a chance to heal by modifying activities, and, and you just have to stop injuring it also at the same time. So that's plantar fascia. It's a very common condition. Um, many people you know, maybe you, have experienced this. Um, moving on, um, since I have way too many slides for my 20 minutes, uh, moving on to Achilles problems. Now, aside from the Achilles rupture, which is um, fairly common in and of itself, uh, chronic Achilles problems are also very common. I would just distinguish between two of those for you. If you look at the picture on the left, you'll see there's a knot, a lump of tissue, what we call fusiform enlargement of the Achilles tendon. There's a lump of tissue in the Achilles tendon seven to nine centimeters above where it inserts into your heel bone. That enlargement of the Achilles tendon is the exact same process taking place that I just talked about with the plantar fascia. It's not a tendonitis, it's a disruption of the collagen fibers. Either they're splitting side to side, some of them are becoming torn uh, at the microscopic level. Uh, the tendon is degenerating. In response to the tendon degenerating, collagen is again being laid down to try to repair it but it's poorly organized, it's immature, it does not have the same tensile strength as the regular Achilles. And so you have a tendon that's much thicker, but also much weaker. By the time you see something like that on the left side there, you see that thickening of the Achilles. We know that some of the fibers in your Achilles are disrupted. Uh, it's probably worth getting it checked out um, because it could rupture if enough of those fibers are disrupted. You can go on to a chronic rupture of the Achilles. 
Um, now you'll see on the right, this is an MRI image. Here the bone is going to be dark. You have a really inflamed area right here. Here's the Achilles tendon, here's your heel bone. Right above the heel bone, you see this large area of fluid. That would be this sack of fluid cushioning between the Achilles and the heel bone becoming grossly inflamed and kind of spreading out here. So the fluid is now leaking out up into this area. That is a bursitis. A bursa is a sac of cushioning fluid that forms between the tendon and the bone. It also forms in the elbows and the shoulders. Bursitis in the heel can be very painful. Um, that's actually fairly easy to treat. What's not as easy to treat is you see within the tendon here, calcium spurs right where the tendon is connecting to the heel. You see these voids, these areas where the, the dark, strong tendon material seems to have an altered signal intensity. It seems to be less, it seems to be less dense. And this is degenerative, weakened, poorly organized tendon material. Here you actually see swelling within the bone itself. So this edema, this swelling within your heel bone is evidence of a painful chronic injury at the interface between the tendon and the bone. We call this calcific tendonitis and this uh, bursitis. So those are some of the Achilles problems we see. There are treatments for those. Um, there's actually a fairly effective non-surgical treatment for this tendinosis. Um, the Alfredson protocols, if you want to look those up, can be very effective for those. Um, I think I somehow have this on auto switching screen. <laughs> Maybe it's trying to hurry me up. Maybe somebody's telling me something. So anyway, we'll move on. Another problem that we see very commonly, bunions, hallux abducto valgus. Now this is a severe example, I understand that, but I think it makes the point very well. These bones um, in your toes we call phalanges. Below those bones are metatarsals. So the phalanges are the toes up here, they end there. This, you'll see that the metatarsal bones in this foot model are very straight. That's an ideal alignment. You want all the metatarsals to line up very straight next to each other not a lot of deviation. If you see what actually causes the bunion is when this first metatarsal, the one by your big toe, the one behind your big toe, leans out and away from the other bones. So these other metatarsal bones, we'll show you an x-ray about that. Actually, it's not a bump growing on your foot. Yes, a bump does grow, but that's not the primary problem. Primary problem is the alignment of these metatarsal bones within your foot, either through inheritance, poor shoe gear, injury, those metatarsals start to deviate and the first metatarsal starts to spread out away from the second metatarsal. So your foot widens. In response to that, your toe gets pushed in towards your second toe. So the big toe rotates in toward the second toe and you're left with this point of contact where the first metatarsal is sticking out, the first toe is rotated in and that creates this prominence. Um, I don't think I have an x-ray yet, but we'll get to one. A uh, little information about bunions. Very, very common problem also. The risk for bunions increases with age, and that's because that gradual change in the alignment of your foot is a progressive situation. You inherit a tendency toward bunions, we think, much like you might inherit a tendency toward hypertension, um, a tendency toward heart disease, but you don't actually have that when you're born. It takes time for that um, trait to show. So when you have, um, the other thing is that shoes contribute dramatically to bunions. A uh, uh, very stark example of that, I think this was a brilliant study um, that some podiatrists did in conjunction with some archaeologists. Um, I don't know how to quite make this stop rotating automatically. It just keeps churning, so I'll try to keep up. In the 12th and 13th century, these types of shoes, these poulains with the long pointy toe were not in fashion. If you look in graveyards of even rich people buried in the 12th and 13th century, almost none of them have bunions. Starting in the 14th and 15th centuries, so the 13 and 1400s, as these shoes became fashionable, you start to see skeletons like this being dug up. So there's a very strong correlation and, and the richer the, um, so there are some cemeteries where the richer population was buried. 
And, and these seem to be associated, feet like this seem to be associated with wealth. So those who could afford these fashionable pointy shoes would have a much higher incidence of bunion deformities. You can see this must have been a very cripplingly problematic case of bunions for this person. Um, in fact, these shoes became so popular that in 1463, one of the kings of England banned shoes that extended more than two inches past the tip of the toe. I don't know exactly why, I was just sick of looking at them, I guess. So the bunion again is not just a bump. Here we now see the x-ray of what I was talking about before. You have the fairly straight, normal alignment here on the left foot, where the metatarsal bones, those bones that are buried in the foot, all line up. And then you have on the right foot that deviation, the first metatarsal deviating out away from the second metatarsal. These little bones that you see here, everybody's got them. They're called sesamoids, but they become dislocated in a severe bunion deformity, as you see here. So when we treat the bunion, I mean, obviously you can just live with it. You don't have to correct it, but if it becomes painful, if it limits your shoe gear, if your gait becomes unstable, if your second toe, third toe, start to hurt because your bunion's not taking its share of the weight, then you may want to have it fixed. And the way that you fix it, um, you have to stabilize that joint that is unstable. So here's an example of that, one of the systems we're using now called the lapoplasty. You place the screws and the plates after resecting the joint surfaces, and that keeps the bunion from forming. The problem with bunion surgery, uh, it's, it's actually very effective. There are some risks, risks of stiffness, weakness, things like that. But the biggest problem is it just takes a long time to heal. You're looking at three to four months to get back to sprinting, cutting, running, jumping, all of the really aggressive activities that people want to do. Let's move on to hammer toes. Hammer toes is actually a constellation of deformities. We call all of these things hammer toes. The true hammer toe is the second, third, fourth toes contracting up at the metatarsal phalangeal joint and down here. So basically it's just a crooked toe. It's a toe where the knuckle sticks up. When the knuckle sticks up like that, hmm, yeah, I think this thing is really trying to hurry me now. I'll go down here and don't see. Hold on just a second. So as the knuckle sticks up, it rubs in shoes on the top of the toe, but also the pain seems to be under the ball of the foot, a very common place to get a pain called metatarsalgia. Hammer toes can, again, primarily be traced to shoe gear. They seem to be much more common in females. Now, here's the thing I didn't mention. If you were to dig up a skeleton, you would not know by looking at the foot if it was male or female. Men and women have the same feet. You know, pelvises may be different and so forth, but we have the same feet. And yet women have much more of these kinds of foot problems. And really, the, the reason for that traditionally would be the shoe gear. Luckily here in Colorado, Colorado chic is a little bit more friendly to feed and so we don't have quite as many of these deformities. Certainly over time, hammer toes become more common. Um, injury to the joint can cause a hammer toe. Um, there are certain foot types that are associated with it. So one thing I wanted to point out, on an MRI, you'll see that some of the hammer toes can become dislocated. There's a structure under the foot that only in the last several years we've become cognizant of and much more aware of and, and watched out for much more. There is a structure on the bottom of the foot called the plantar plate right here. And that plantar plate is a heavy, strong fibrocartilage structure that keeps your toe lined up where it's supposed to be. It's very common for people to injure that plantar plate, either chronically over time Maybe they have a bunion, so it's not taking any weight, so too much weight goes to this toe. So over time, that plantar plate can wear out, or you could have one sudden injury, and the plantar plate could be lost because of that. If the plantar plate becomes ruptured, then the toe will actually dislocate. That allows you to develop a hammer toe. So often now you'll hear us talk about a plantar plate injury. We often get an MRI to check for plantar plate injuries, whereas the idea of getting an MRI on a routine hammer toe before might have been ridiculous. Now there's a rationale behind it. it, makes a lot of sense. You wanna see if this heavy fibrocartilage structure, not this tendon, but this heavier structure, is actually still connected to the toe. If not, then you have a higher risk of that hammer toe progressing. Let's move on to the dreaded Morton's neuroma. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this or not. <laughs> there is a nerve on the ball of the foot that is under a lot of stress in certain types of feet. 
That nerve is the skin nerve on the bottom of the foot between the third and fourth toes. Two nerves from the foot come together right there. Two areas of the foot come together right there. And there's a lot of motion and a lot of pressure just at that spot. Because of that, the nerve that runs between these bones is often under a tremendous amount of stress. That stress manifests at times by the nerve becoming fibrously enlarged. So you see normal nerves are about a millimeter in diameter. When you have chronic irritation there, the nerve will become much larger, as you see in that green circle. That is a classic neuroma. A neuroma is not, I do not know why that is turning so frequently. Apologize again. <laughs> the neuroma is not a tumor, okay? It's not a true oma. What it is is a fibrous enlargement of a repetitively irritated, stressed nerve on the ball of the foot. Much more common in people whose metatarsal arch, so everybody knows there's a long arch to the foot. There's also supposed to be an arch across the ball of the foot we call the metatarsal arch. If you have problems with that metatarsal arch, then that neuroma becomes much more uh, common. We can treat these through a variety of ways, wide shoes to keep the pressure from squeezing the nerve side to side, put a pad behind the nerve to keep the pressure off of it from the bottom, avoid high heels, avoid sprinting exercises, going up and down hills, and so forth. So the neuroma can also be treated with cortisone injection to shrink it, and occasionally you can shoot it with alcohol platelets or remove it surgically. But if you have a tingling, burning pain on the ball of your foot, if it feels like there's a sock wadded up under the ball of your foot, that's a very common complaint we hear with these. If you have shooting symptoms to your third and fourth toes, and if the pain can become so severe after hiking or walking or riding a bike for a while, that you just have to stop. You have to take off your shoe and kind of massage your foot out. That may well be a Morton's neuroma, named after Dr. Morton, by the way. Let's move on. Uh, this is something that a lot of people are aware of, uh, diabetes and the feet. It's a large part of what we see, um, not because statistically um, there are a lot of diabetic uh, patients in the valley, but diabetic people do have a tremendous amount of problems with their feet, a lot of concerns related to the feet. This is a patient who drew a bath, um, stood in the bath water for a few seconds, and then sat down. And as she sat down, realized that the bath water was scalding hot. By the time, so when she sat down, she could feel that, but her feet didn't tell her that. By the time she realized that, her feet had these second degree burns and blisters on them. Um, this isn't a huge catastrophe, this healed all right, but you can see that when you can't feel your feet, and this is one thing we'll talk about with diabetes, you are prone to certain injuries. This is another one. Luckily, um, this is not something we see in Colorado, but this is a patient who had a small blister form on the top of the foot um, that subsequently opened up, drained some purulent material, and then formed a little wound, and the wound just progressively got larger and larger. This is a view of the same wound, uh, I think they said nine months later, after nine months of just chronic inflammation and irritation. Um, tendons were originally exposed, um, the wound went very deep. This is the brown recluse spider bite. Uh, I bring this up just to point out that sometimes if you can't feel your feet, you put on a shoe, you don't know what's in the shoe. You don't shake out the pebbles, you don't know what's in the shoe. You can be injured by the shoe that you're wearing, um, sometimes quite badly before you even realize that you're being injured. This is a person who had a spider in their shoe. The spider bit them, they didn't realize it till much later, and it turned into a uh, large, a massive ulceration. It takes a long, long time to heal. Um, usually a matter of several months to a couple of years to heal from one of these aggressive uh, recluse, brown recluse bite ulcerations. So why do diabetic feet have uh, particular concerns? One thing is that the nerves can become injured through the diabetes, the hyperglycemia. Neuropathy is very common in diabetes. The longer you've had diabetes, the more common neuropathy becomes. Very important to screen your feet. If you have diabetes, check for changes to your sensation. 
Sometimes you'll feel painful symptoms at night, tingling and burning that can keep you up. That can be the first sign you have of neuropathy. Other times, uh, people don't even realize they have neuropathy until they see a wound on their foot. So, checking your feet regularly when you have diabetes. Um, new diabetics should all be given advice about how to care for their feet. Um, another problem is vasculopathy. This vasculopathy it means circulation problems, essentially. That usually is in the microcirculation primarily. So you can have good arteries coming down to your feet, but the micro vessels that supply your skin and the most delicate structures in your feet um, don't have very good perfusion, very good blood supply. So when you can't feel and you don't have good blood supply, you can get injured, and then it's very difficult for you to heal an injury. It takes longer to heal an injury when you have a poor blood supply. And then finally, the immunopathy. Blood sugar over 300, your white blood cells just don't work. Um, so the white blood cells that fight infection uh, really don't work if you have chronic hyperglycemia, chronic high blood sugar. So that's what we call the dangerous triad of diabetic feet. That's why so many diabetics end up with ulcerations, infections, and uh, fortunately this is much less common now, but amputations, um, very common in the diabetic population. So let's go on to one of the more concerning manifestations of diabetic feet, be the Charcot foot. Charcot foot, that's again named after a doctor, Charcot. Charcot foot is probably about the worst thing that you can see in diabetes because it can create problems that are very difficult to manage. It's sometimes called the rocker bottom foot after the bottom of a rocking chair. Uh, one of the types of nerves that is affected in diabetic are called autonomic nerves. Those nerves of your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system actually control the rate of blood flow to your feet. So when you're in a fight or flight response, your sympathetic nervous system will tend to constrict the blood flow to your feet. Well, when you have an injury to your feet, initially there's a lot of swelling and excessive blood flow, what we call hyperemia to the foot. Over time though, your body has to adapt and turn off the spigot so you don't continue with that high, high level of blood flow to your feet. Well, when you have diabetes, the nerves that turn off that excessive blood flow may not be functioning. So you end up with a high, high rate of blood flow, what we call bounding pulses. You can feel the pulses on this foot and there's a very powerful. Um, this causes weakening or washing away of some of the calcium within the bone, so the bones become weakened. On top of that, you can't feel the joints in the foot. We adjust our position countless times during the day and night because we get nerve feedback that our feet are tired and they need to move. We need to move into a new position. Well, if you can't feel that, you don't know when your joints are becoming excessively stressed when ligaments are starting to become injured by staying in one place too long, when the muscles are fatiguing that are trying to help hold your foot up. Uh, and so in, in other words, the support structures in your feet don't supply you with feedback and they can start to break down. The ligaments can start to stretch out. The bones can actually start to collapse, fragment. Joints will dislocate. Uh, that's what tends to happen in Charcot foot. So this is a fairly extreme example. I hope nobody um, really has to face that, although we do see several cases of this uh, in the office every year. Um, the only way to treat it is to get people completely off of the foot before it does what you see in the picture down here on the bottom right, and that is collapse with that cuboid bone coming out through the bottom of the foot. Um, that's a very difficult foot to manage because the skin there is too thin to support all the stress going through it, and so ulcerations, Bone infections um, and amputations are very common once the foot becomes collapsed to that degree. So there are ways to take care of your feet. I'm not going to go through all of this. There are a lot of different places online where you could just look up diabetic foot care recommendations. Um, very important to follow those recommendations. The one thing you want to get in the habit of right away is checking your feet every single day. Look between your toes, look at the bottom of your foot, look at the back of your heel. If you can't see it, get a mirror or have somebody help you. If you do have a problem, it starts as a small problem, then it becomes a much bigger problem. You, end, you won't end up coming in with a deep, very chronic wound that you didn't know was there until you saw blood on the shower floor or something. You'll know before those kind of things happen. 
So foot care with diabetes is very important. Let's, uh, I think, I mean, that's all for the, you know, I guess the foot care 101 part of the lecture. This is something I'm kind of interested in. This isn't as much of a thing as it was, say, 10 years ago when the whole barefoot running um, was so big. There's a question that I'm asked quite commonly, though, still, and that is, is it better for your feet to wear shoes or not to wear shoes? And you could make a case, I think, either way. Um, I will say this, the one thing we know for sure is that it's better not to wear bad shoes. High heel, pointy, unsupportive shoes do have repercussions. They cause a lot of problems. But is it better to have shoes on if they're good shoes? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, recently, and this is kind of interesting, something I'm interested in, 40,000 years ago, um, the first shoes that we know of were worn by ancestral humans in the Tianyuan cave, I won't try to pronounce that, in China. They found that they were wearing shoes with firm soles 40,000 years ago. Neanderthals went extinct 40,000 years ago, and they never wore shoes. They would at best wrap a piece of leather around their feet. So my working hypothesis is that shoes are what separated us from the Neanderthals. That's why we were able to win. That's why they went extinct. Just kidding about that. I don't think that's actually established. But it's an interesting uh, fact that humans have worn shoes ever since we've had the ability to wear shoes. There has to be some benefit to wearing shoes, and I think it's very obvious. Think about how many of our ancestors stepped on something sharp, got infected, and got taken off the board. So when you look at injury rates with shoes and without shoes, musculoskeletal injuries, bone and joint injuries, are about the same in people who wear shoes and people who don't wear shoes, okay? So if you, and that's talking about highly trained people who are used to running barefoot, who, who compete at that level. If you look at a study of 201 runners over one year, there were many, many musculoskeletal injuries. If you see there, it says more of the injuries, 156 of the injuries occurred in people who did wear shoes, what they call the shod population. So you would say, oh, well, wearing shoes causes more injuries because only 125 people who are barefoot had injuries. But when you take into account the mileage, the people who ran in shoes ran a much higher mileage. And so when you factored in the actual mileage, the injury rate was exactly the same between people who wore shoes and people who didn't wear shoes. But that was bone, joint, and tendon injuries. What is indisputable is that the people who didn't wear shoes had many more injuries and lost a lot more running time due to simple lacerations, punctures, and skin injuries to the bottom of the foot. So even if shoes do not necessarily protect you from ankle, hip, or knee pain any better than being barefoot, you have to be very careful about running unshod. You have to be very careful running barefoot because plantar skin injuries, surface injuries, much, much more common. 30% of those runners suffered an injury if they weren't wearing shoes to the skin on the bottom of the foot that was of enough severity to cause them to miss some running time. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, all right, thank you uh, for paying attention to the lecture. Please again submit your questions if you have them to the Q&A. Um, if there are some questions that um, are relevant, I think they'll be bringing those in to me to talk to you about. Um, and also please fill out a survey. Um, and a reminder again, February 2nd, Dr. Pevney is going to be talking about common ligament injuries of the knee. So thank you very much. Thanks, that was great. Um, we do have a couple of questions that we just wanted to ask you on um, a bunch of thank yous, first of all. But we had somebody who asked if you have noticed any relationship between declining hormones and or thyroid and foot issues or um, if there's any correlation between those two. Yeah, me personally, definitely. <laughs> Declining heart. <laughs> I know there's a diabetic yeah. um, um, correlation, but... Yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that I have noticed that correlation. Okay. Um, I'd have to think about that for a little bit. Uh, certainly, you know, with the thyroid hormones being in, essentially in, uh, directly relevant to growth and, and homeostasis in so many ways, I think that that could be related, but I don't have studies 
and I don't have a personal experience noticing those kinds of things. Okay. Certainly, um, hormone levels, uh, as far as relate as they relate to osteoporosis, mm -hmm. you know, definitely increase the risk of stress injury.